Good morning, everybody. We're live here from the Bird House, and it is the end of May. It is Saturday, May 28th. We are in Memorial Day weekend, and today I thought I'd go over some cavity nesting birds. There's a lot of nesting activity going on right now, including birds in your backyard, in your in bird houses, and also out in some natural cavities like hollow trees. And so I thought I'd share with you the cavity nesting species that we do have here in the area. And as always, we love to see uh, your comments. You can always say just hello. Um, we love to know what kind of things you're seeing out there in your backyards or when you're out hiking. So you can put those in the comments. And of course, if you have any questions, throw those in there as well. Uh, but let's talk about cavity nesting birds because not all birds do nest in cavities, but these are some of the species that we do have around here that do. So <clears throat> the first um, I'd like to go over is bluebirds, of course, and everybody who is lucky enough to get bluebirds absolutely loves uh, watching how many broods they have and loves watching that their bluebirds grow up. It can be hard to get bluebirds because they do like a wide open habitat. They like tall grasses, they like fields, meadows, that kind of habitat. So uh, as far as a backyard bird goes, they can be really hit or miss with people. Some people are actually lucky enough to just get them coming to their feeders, but not nesting. So it can be a mixed bag. But if you are by a very wooded area, the odds of you getting bluebirds is probably not that good um, because they do like the very open kind of grassland type of habitat. So this is your typical bluebird habitat here, wide open space, farm fields are a great place to look for the bluebirds. And they do nest in bird boxes, of course, and they'll also nest in tree cavities, empty tree cavities. Um, this is your typical bluebird nest and they use a lot of tall grasses. They weave them all together. So they have a pretty neat looking nest. So some of these birds have nests that are kind of all uh, disheveled and in disarray, but the, the bluebirds nests are pretty neat, nicely woven together. And they have blue eggs, just like a robin does. They're in the same family, the thrush family as the robin. So they do have eggs that look very similar. And the bluebirds can have two or three broods a year. And um, as far as what everybody has been reporting is that um, they are with their first brood right now, eggs have hatched and the parents are actively feeding the young. And of course you can feed them mealworms as their preferred type of food. So it sounds like the young haven't fledged yet, but they probably will very, very soon. And what's neat about bluebirds is that the young from the first or second brood will usually stick around and help raise uh, the, the other young that will come further down the line. So that this first brood here, once they fledge, they'll probably stick around with their parents and help raise um, the next brood that comes about. So they have a nice family structure going on, at least for that first year. Um, so bluebirds are definitely out and about and they are definitely nesting. Um, last year, I didn't get any bluebird houses out until this weekend, actually Memorial Day weekend, and I still had luck with attracting some. So if you're interested in attracting some bluebirds and you think, well, it might be too late, you still have a, you still will have some time. They start nesting pretty early. They're one of our earliest nesting songbirds. Sometimes they'll start nesting as early as late March, um, depending on the weather but you still have some time to put out some of these birdhouses. So it's not, not too, too late. Um, and then here's, here's your bluebird again. So gorgeous, gorgeous birds that are cavity nesters. And if you're lucky enough to get bluebirds in that wide open habitat, most likely, um, you might get tree swallows. So this is another cavity nester. They will go into the same type of house as a bluebird. And that's going to be any kind of house that has an opening that's at least an inch and a half in diameter so they can squeeze in there. Um, tree swallows seem to like the houses that have a circular entrance hole. We also have sparrow resistant houses for bluebirds that have a rectangular hole um, that bluebirds seem to really like. And the tree swallows do like that circular hole um, for their house. And you can tell you have a tree swallow nest because they use a lot of feathers in their nest building. So they'll um, pluck out some of their own feathers and they'll use that to line the nest. So they'll weave a bunch of grasses together and then you've got a whole bunch of feathers here. And that is a sure sign that you have yourself a tree swallow. And if you put out bluebird houses, um, you might very well get house sparrows. And <clears throat> house sparrows can be 
difficult um, for people um, because they um, will sometimes take over bluebird houses. They are known to, you know, sometimes well, not only take over the nest, but destroy the eggs or even, um, you know, kill the young or kill um, the, the female bluebird when she's sitting on the nest. So they can be pretty brutal, but it's not only house sparrows that will do that. Wrens can do it too. So house sparrows get a really bad rap um, about that, but also wrens are known to do that as well. So um, they're not, they're, they're not all sweet and innocent. Um, the thing about house sparrows is are not a native bird. So they are an introduced species, meaning that um, they are considered invasive. So you can actually remove the nest of the house sparrow. You can remove their eggs. You could remove the birds themselves if you want to from that nesting cavity. So um, with most birds, you absolutely can't do that. They're all protected. But house sparrows, the European starling and um, pigeons are not protected. So uh, as far as house sparrows go, they're cavity nesters. And um, this is what their nest looks like. Um, these are pretty neat. They usually use kind of a mix of different things to build their nest. Sometimes you might even find like pieces of plastic in there, like cellophane or um, pieces of plastic bags woven in. So they'll, they'll sometimes use um, that kind of thing as well with their nest building. And their nests are going to be more messy as far as what's inside them. Um, you might find droppings and that kind of thing in the nest. So this is your typical house sparrow nest. And if you are having house sparrows go into your bluebird house, or if you're worried that they might take over a bluebird house, you can always put out what's called a sparrow scarer. And um, they're contraptions that look like this. They're reflective strips of tape that will hang uh, down on top of the house. The idea behind this is that birds in general don't like shiny reflective objects. It scares them away. If you have bluebirds that have established a nest, so meaning they've built the nest and they've laid at least an egg in that nest, you can put up a sparrow scarer and that will help scare any sparrows away from the house and will discourage them from trying to use it. But because the bluebirds are established, they won't leave the nest. So we do now have actual sparrow scarer kits. And so if you are experiencing some of um, <clears throat> this competition between bluebirds and, and house sparrows, you can put up one of these scares and that can absolutely help keep them away. Another thing you can do is put your nest boxes in pairs and that can help. So if you've got two houses that are within, usually within like 10 feet of each other, that can alleviate some competition there as well. So sometimes bluebirds will use one and the sparrows will use another or bluebirds and um, wrens or tree swallows and house sparrows. So, you know, you can alleviate some of that nest site competition by putting out more nesting cavities as well. So if you ever see a bluebird trail or a meadow where things are in pairs, that's the reason why it does help alleviate some of that competition. Purple martins are another type of cavity nesting bird that we have here. And unlike some of the other birds I've mentioned, the purple martins can be pretty difficult to get. It's um, They have very specific uh, things that they like with their houses. They do like wide open areas and they also like to be around water if possible, like a big pond. You can find them by the lake. If you ever go to Montezuma, they have a really nice established purple martin colony. And purple martins are the kind of bird that like to nest all together. So the per your typical purple martin house will have multiple cavities in it. And here you can see there's a purple martin house, but then there's also gourds. So they do nest in gourds as well. If you ever see a pole with a whole bunch of hanging gourds on it, those are for purple martins as well. So they do like to nest all together. They can be hard to attract at, uh, just to kind of get established um, because with houses like this, um, the holes are nice and big. So you might get starlings in them. You might get house sparrows in them. So they can be hard to establish, but once established, they come back to the same place every year to nest. So purple martins can be hit or miss. Um, you definitely want to you know, maintain the house, 
to keep some of those other birds out like the starlings and the sparrows. And you'll find usually that early in the season, the houses will have doors on them so the cavities are closed off. So birds can't nest in there until the purple martins come back. So that's one way of keeping starlings and sparrows out because they're here all year. So they'll start nesting kind of early in the season. Um, but you can have these kind of doors on them to, to kind of block off their access until the purple martins come back and then the doors come off and the martins can nest. So really, really cool type of bird in that same family as the tree swallow, um, you know, fly around and pick insects off um, in the air mid-flight. So really, really neat to watch. So these are the purple martins. And then a typical backyard bird that you can get is going to be a wren. Wrens aren't super picky about where they nest and I've brought that up many times before that we get all kinds of interesting phone calls about places that wrens are nesting, um, not just houses, but, um, you know, mailboxes, garages, um, um, puts, had their clothing up on a clothesline and a wren started nesting in the pocket of one of the shirts. So it doesn't take them long to start building a nest. Um, you can tell you have a wren if you have a house with a lot of sticks in it. And um, the wren male will start the nest building process. He'll you know, find different cavities and start building nests in multiple cavities. He'll sing and sing and sing to attract a mate. She'll come and look at all the different spots and then she decides where she wants to establish the nest and continue that nest building process. So if you've ever had a birdhouse that just has a little kind of layer of sticks in it and nothing else, that was from a wren that started the nest building process, but the female decided to go elsewhere. So um, we've been getting lots of reports of wrens nesting. There's been some that have fledged already. We've got two different species that are commonly coming to houses. This is going to be the house wren. And here's a picture of the house wren here. And then the Carolina wren. And wren houses, you can hang in a tree. They just need a small opening of an inch in diameter because they are such a small bird. And some wren houses actually have just um, almost like a triangular opening, so a larger opening. And the idea behind those is that it allows for them to bring in those big sticks because sometimes it's hard for them to maneuver those big long sticks into a small little circular hole. So there are specialized Carolina wren and wren um, houses that you can also get. So here's your Carolina wren, very prolific singer. And uh, you can hear them singing uh, all season long. They're very, very uh, vocal. And then here's your house wren showing off that common wren posture with the tail sticking right up in the air. So. Um, and then there's chickadees. Everybody loves chickadees and they are cavity nesting species. And um, chickadees will tend to have just one brood a year, but they can have several eggs in that brood. And um, they will nest in a smaller size house. They'll sometimes nest in wren houses. They need an opening that's an inch and an eighth in diameter. So they can usually squeak into a wren house depending on the size of the hole that's, that's in there. And chickadees build a nest that has a lot of moss. So here's a typical chickadee nest here. Um, they don't build a really tall nest. They're just kind of a, a short, small nest with a lot of moss. And here's a few um, chickadee chicks here sitting on their, their little nest. So um, as far as chickadees go, some of them have started the nest building and um, they've some have fledged already, but there is still some time. Um, there are still some people who are just getting chickadees coming to their houses. So you still have some time to attract some of these cavity nesters. And then another typical common backyard bird that's a cavity nester is going to be the tufted titmouse. So they will nest in houses. They'll also nest in uh, hollow holes of a tree. And here's a picture of a pair here nesting in a tree. And they're in the same family as the chickadee. So they are both in that same group. So they can commonly be found uh, in the same kind of habitat, eating the same kind of food. So this is your tough to titmouse, another cavity nester. And nuthatches are another cavity nester. Uh, they will nest again in houses, 
we're most likely going to see them nesting in the holes of trees, which is where they forage and that's where they're finding most of their food. So they will nest in these cavities. And we have two different species of nuthatches here. This is the white-breasted nuthatch and then there is the red-breasted nuthatch. So both of these are common cavity nesting species. And talking about this bird, we've been talking about it on and off, especially early in the season when we were seeing an influx of them. This is a brown creeper. And brown creeper, they blend in very, very well with the trees. You can see it um, here blends in very, very well with the bark. They're another cavity nesting species. So they spend their, their time creeping up a tree. So if you see a little brown bird that's kind of sneaking up a tree, it's probably going to be a brown creeper. And they are another cavity nesting species that you can find here in the upstate New York area. And our woodpeckers are also cavity nesters and they will excavate their own nesting cavity. And what's great about woodpeckers is that they'll, they'll build their nesting cavity and they don't necessarily use it year over year. So they create nesting cavities for other birds as well. So we've got the downy woodpecker, um, hairy woodpecker, the red-bellied woodpecker, and even the pileated woodpecker. So um, they are all cavity nesting species that we have here. And you can also get woodpecker houses. Um, they tend to be larger. The woodpeckers don't build a nest like most birds do. They will just lay their eggs in the inside of the tree that usually has wood chips there to kind of pad the nest. So if you buy a woodpecker house, you'll find that usually they come with some wood chips that you can put along the bottom to kind of give those eggs a little bit of padding. So here are some of our woodpecker species that we have that are cavity nesters as well. And nesting in the same type of cavity as woodpecker are going to be the European starling. I mentioned house sparrows earlier are an introduced non-native bird. Same with European starlings, uh, but they are a pretty neat bird. They're, um, they're actually in the minor bird family, so they are kind of a mimicking bird. You might have a, a starling that will mimic the sounds of other birds or even sounds that it hears around. I used to have one in the neighborhood that would mimic a car alarm, um, which was pretty funny. So the starlings are pretty neat uh, and they are also a cavity nesting bird. So you're typically not going to get one in your birdhouse in your backyard unless you do have something larger like a screech owl house or a, uh, a woodpecker box because they do need a pretty large hole in order to squeeze into. And some of you have been reporting great crested flycatcher, and they are a cavity nesting bird as well. And here's a picture of one. They eat a lot of large insects, like this dragonfly here. It's got a beak full of dragonfly. And um, the great crested flycatcher, um, probably not going to nest in a birdhouse, but they will nest in hollow trees. Um, if you happen to uh, find a nesting cavity and you can look in to see what the nest is made of. If there's any kind of snake skin in there, that's probably a great crested flycatcher. They tend to use snake skin um, and weave that into their nest, which is pretty interesting. But great crested flycatcher are definitely out there. They're pretty vocal too. Um, they tend to, to sing quite a bit and uh, they are another cavity nesting species we have here. And then to sum it up, we've got some larger birds that are also cavity nesters like screech owls. And people have had, you know, pretty good luck actually attracting screech owls with an, a, a nesting box. They're not an uncommon bird to have in your backyard, especially if you do have a good amount of woods around. So um, screech owls need an opening as far as the, the diameter of the, the hole that they squeak into. They need one that's about three inches wide. So your screech owl boxes tend to be pretty large and um, they do prefer habitat or you know nesting habitat that has multiple cavities, multiple tree cavities. So your best bet in attracting them is putting out uh, multiple houses um, or putting out houses around natural tree cavities because they will nest in some, they'll store food in others. So um, they do like multiple tree cavities. The thing about screech owls to keep in mind if you do want to attract them and put out houses for them is that they are not only a, a great predator for small rodents and mice and that kind of thing, but sometimes they'll go after songbirds as well. So just keep that in mind um, as far as your screech owls go, um, that they do also eat some songbirds. 
And if you put out a screech owl box, you might also get American kestrel there, another cavity nester. They're, they're, they will nest in the same type of boxes as the screech owl, same size, everything. Um, kestrels you'll find by open fields. They do like wide open fields where they hunt for small mammals, large insects. Um, this time of the year, you can usually find kestrels perched on telephone wires. If you're driving through um, you know, some open area that has lots of phone wires, Keep an eye on what's perched up there. If you see something that looks like a morning dove but has a bigger head, it's probably a kestrel. They're, they're quite small, uh, but they're gonna have a, a much larger head than your typical morning dove. And so they are also a cavity nesting bird. And wood duck, if you happen to be around any kind of swampy area or any kind of wooded, wet area, you might be lucky enough to get wood duck. They are a cavity nester and here's the male and the female here and they'll nest in boxes and they'll also nest in hollow trees. Um, sometimes those trees are way, way up. They have very, very high uh, cavities way up in the tree. And when it comes time for the young to leave the house, they will just, uh, the, sometimes the adults will even just push them out of the house and down they go and they plop it either into the water or onto the forest floor uh, beneath them. So here's a little, a young one leaving the nest. It's a great photo. And then there's also hooded merganser is another bird that will nest in cavities. So we've got a couple duck species that do nest in cavities and this beautiful hooded merganser is another one if you happen to be by water. So that is what I have prepared for you guys today as far as cavity nesting birds. Now is walking through the woods to keep um, your eyes out for some little chirps coming out of holes in trees. As far as woodpeckers go, like the pileated woodpecker, the young will stick their heads right out of the tree and squawk. Um, so you never know what you might find this time of the year. And of course, if you've got houses in your backyard, now is the time you might start to hear those little chirps of the young coming from the house. And as far as providing food for some of these babies, the best thing you can do is put out mealworms because they do require, the, the young require a lot of insect protein in order to grow big and quickly because as far as songbirds go, they're really only in that nesting cavity for a couple weeks before they fledge. So they go from hatching to leaving the nest, usually in two weeks, uh, two weeks time, sometimes a little less, sometimes a little more. So it's really not long at all, um, which is pretty incredible. So um, as always, if you have any kind of questions, you can put those in the comments. Um, we've got some people on here at the moment. Let's see, Bob says, funny you are doing this today as I have a pair of house wrens working on a nest right now. I checked with a camera this morning and building is still in progress. And of course, a lot of singing is going on. So Bob has some house wrens that are just preparing to nest. So definitely still have time to put out those birdhouses if you're interested in attracting some of these cavity nesters. Um, Chris is on. She says, I have some chickadee parents who are so busy lately going in and out of their cavity nest in the tree stump. I can even hear the little babies chirping quietly when they're being fed. Aw. So um, Chris had uh, chickadees nesting in a tree stump in her yard, and it sounds like those eggs have hatched. So pretty exciting time uh, this time of the year. So it looks like that's everybody's comments and questions for today. We'll be back on Tuesday where we will give you an update about the different birds being seen in the area. We'll share your photos and we're starting to get some pretty fun um, insect activity like butterflies and bees visiting the garden. So we'll give you an update on some of those creatures as well. So I hope you guys have a great Memorial weekend. Hopefully you get some time to relax and rest and get some birding in and we will see you on Tuesday with another broadcast.